A Windows Server cluster allows us to use what's called Windows Server nodes, which are just Windows servers, to have high availability and failover capability for various different roles and applications. So if I click on roles, for instance, you can see all the different roles. And what you see here are virtual machines. But you can also add other types of roles, such as file sharing, as well as custom applications. The nodes need to share a storage device, and that storage device can be a storage area network, such as an IBM SAN or a Dell SAN or some other storage area network device. It can also be a Windows server running the iSCSI target role, which is what I'm going to demonstrate here on Windows 2022 servers. I'm on Windows 2022 servers and server manager, and I'm going to choose to add roles and features. And the feature I need to install here is going to be the failover cluster feature. So I'm going to click next until I get to features. And then I'm going to choose failover clustering and choose any additional features as required. And I'll click install. We'll need to do this on every server node that's going to be in our cluster. So in this case, I've got two different servers that are going to be in this new cluster. So I'll need to install this role on the other server as well. The two server nodes that will be in our cluster are called server one and server two. I'm in my other server and I'm going to go ahead and run through that same installation as well. This usually only takes a couple of minutes to install. And then I need to configure the storage that I'll be using that these two devices will need to connect to. So I'm going to click on Add Roles and Features so I can add the server role to add in the iSCSI target. And you can see this server is a member of the domain, but it does not have to be as it is just all IP based. I'm going to expand File and Storage Services. And I'm going to expand File and iSCSI Services. And then I'm going to choose the iSCSI target server and click Add Features. Now I'm going to choose Next, Next, and Install. The iSCSI target role has been added, so I'll click Close. And now when I click on File and Storage Services and iSCSI, I see a new option that wasn't there before. So I'm going to create an iSCSI virtual disk. Now, this is not the same as a Hyper-V virtual disk. This is something that is going to be a virtual disk because I'm using a portion of an actual disk that's going to be available to the other server nodes. So I'll choose New iSCSI Virtual Disk, and the wizard appears. And now I need to choose an entire hard drive or just a folder on the server that I'm going to make available for this iSCSI target. I'm going to choose a custom path, which allows me to set up a folder on a drive that already exists. So I've got the C drive that you see here. I'm going to highlight that, choose new folder, and just call this iSCSI target, but you can call it whatever works for you. And now it's showing up as C colon backslash iSCSI target. So that folder won't be available for any other use besides access by the server nodes in the cluster. I'll click next. Now I need to give that virtual disk a name. I'll call it vdisk1. Click next. Now I need to choose how much space I'm going to have on there. You can see I have 110 gigabytes. I'm just going to create a small amount here, just a 10 gigabyte partition, although you can choose any size here that you'd like. The fixed size will allow the speed to be the fastest. However, dynamically expanding will just expand as it's needed. So if you're running low on space, then you could go ahead and choose the dynamically expanding option. Otherwise, the fixed size is the fastest one. I'm going to choose the dynamically expanding option. There's also a third option called differencing that has to do with a parent-child relationship with another disk. So that doesn't really apply to us here. I'm going to go ahead and click Next to continue. Next, I'm going to click Next under the new iSCSI target name. And I'll call it Target 1 and click Next. Now, here are the iSCSI initiators that are going to need to be added in to be able to connect to this. So not just any device can connect to it. You have to be on this list. If I click Add, 
I can go ahead and query the iSCSI initiators for specific computers. I'm going to cancel out just for a second, and I'm going to go into the iSCSI initiators of my two server nodes, turn those services on, and then come back to this spot. The failover cluster roles have been successfully added on the two servers. Now I'm going to go into Tools and iSCSI Initiator so I can connect to my iSCSI target that I just set up. So what I need to do is to go ahead and click Yes to start. And what that will do is it will automatically communicate with my iSCSI target server. I need to do this also on my other server node. And this server, that's going to be a server node in our cluster, also completed. And I'll just do the same thing and choose to turn on the iSCSI initiator. And once again, I'll click Yes. And now it's been enabled on both. Now I'm going to switch back to my target server and make the connection. Now I'm going to click on the Add button. And I can choose to query the initiator for the iSCSI initiator on that server. Now, if I actually have the value, I can just go ahead and paste it in the value at the bottom. So I'll click on Browse and type in the name of the server. And we'll start with Server1. It found it in the directory. And now I can click OK. And there is the value for the iSCSI initiator. You can see in the value there, it also shows the name of the server and domain as well. Now I'm going to do the same thing for server two. So I'll click browse, check names, click OK, and I click OK. And now it sees the IQN for both servers. The iSCSI initiator ID or IQN number is basically the same as DNS is for names to IP addresses. It's just the way that the iSCSI target and the iSCSI initiator servers, in this particular case, server nodes in a cluster, can communicate with each other. So I'll click Next. And CHAP is a way that we can add authentication between the devices, such as the two servers and the storage area network. I've seen CHAP actually cause more problems than it helped. So in this particular case, I'm not going to enable it. And mainly it's because it causes a lot of disconnects. But you may decide to employ it and test it out. And I'll click Create. And now the connection has been made. I'm going to go back into each of the two server nodes and connect it from the initiator back to the target. I'm in Server 1. I'm going to go to Tools and go back into the iSCSI Initiator. The service has already started, and it will continue to start every time the server has been restarted. Now I just need to put in the target, which is going to be the IP address of the iSCSI target. Click Quick Connect. It finds it. And click Done. And if I go over to Discovery, I should see the connection is there, favorite targets it shows up, and under Volumes and Devices, sometimes you just have to hit Auto Configure for it to show up, and now I can click OK. I've made the same connection on my Server 2, so now I can just go into Failover Cluster Manager, which has been installed in both server nodes, and I've got my storage ready to go. So now officially, after we add the servers into the Failover Cluster Manager, we instead refer to those servers as nodes instead of just servers. Sometimes I'll call them server nodes, just so you'll understand that that's what I'm talking about. Now I need to create my cluster. And this is actually the easy part. The hard part is already over. I'll just right click and choose to create the cluster. The wizard shows up, so I'll click Next. And now I need to add in my two servers. So I'll just type those in and click Add. It goes through a little bit of verification before it finishes. The server that's not local definitely takes a little bit longer to verify. And if that server is busy, then you may get an error the first time, but you can always try again after another minute or two. The second server has been added. I'll click Next. And it's a good idea to run the validation tests in order to find out if you have any issues with your cluster, and then you can fix those prior to continuing. As long as you don't get any errors on those validations, or if you do and you fix them, you can move on to the next step 
and I'll just go ahead and give the cluster a name. I'll call it cluster one. And you need to give it an IP address. So this needs to be an IP that's not currently in use. So I'll choose .236 and click Next. What it's going to do in the background is it's going to go into your DNS server and create cluster one dot whatever your domain is. In my case, it's cluster one dot my domain dot int. However, sometimes it doesn't happen right away and you can go into the DNS server manager of your domain controller and you can go ahead and manually add it instead of having to wait. Now it's creating the cluster. The cluster has completed. I'll click finish. And now it should show up in the upper left-hand corner, and there it is. Here's our two nodes that are our servers, Server 1 and Server 2. And we see that they're both functioning, which is great. Under storage, I haven't added any storage yet, even though I set it up where I connected to the storage area network. But right now, there are no disks as of yet. And I've also added no additional roles. So we see that area is blank as well. There's several more steps in order to complete this project. One is to add in the disk storage and also add in any server roles that you would like to be redundant. And of course, add in a disk witness to handle any quorum votes. And all those will be discussed in upcoming videos.